I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, Billy, we have some interesting topics today um, from, you know, things that I would like to talk about to things I'm not so fond of talking about. (laughs) But the great thing about both those topics is we have one of our favorite guests today, uh, Dr. Jonathan Larson, our resident entomologist here um, on From the Woods today. And he's going to be talking about, yes, pollinators, um, Mm -hmm. which, you know, a lot of people have very positive connotations of. And then then he's going to be talking about um, a little bit later in the show we're going to have him give a little update he was doing a, a kind of a tick study um, project so you, we talked about that at one point here on the show before we'll have him talk about that a little bit and he might talk a little bit about ticks and some of the things we need to be thinking about but we also have the tree of the week um, this is a really cool tree that if you're kind of in in a nice wooded cove area you might see this tree flowering right now so we'll see that one from Laurie here in a little bit but delighted to have you all with us today you can use the chat function to interact with us or if you're on um, YouTube live. We would love to have you uh, email from you, um, forestry.extension at uky.edu, and we can get um, some questions answered that way. But um, again, thank you all for being with us today. Definitely. So let's go ahead and get started. We are going to start with pollinators. So uh, Dr. Larson, if you want to get them on. Hey! Hey, there he is! Hey. Welcome back to the show. <laughs> thank you for having me. I feel a little bit like we're doing a Beauty and the Beast kind of segment today. <laughs> kind uh, of, a little about- bit talk about things people like. Uh, I appreciate that opportunity. And then we're going to talk about some of the things that people hate the most in ticks. <laughs> so we'll start with the pollinators, start with the happy. Uh, I appreciate you. that we get to talk about them because it is pollinator week. Mm-hmm. Uh, pollinator week is celebrated in uh, the United States and across the world in order to try and show people just how important these critters are. And so I guess what I decided to do today is just to show off some of the different kinds of pollinators that you right. can experience here in Kentucky. Uh, and then talk about ways that people can try to enhance them on their property. Uh, So when we talk about pollinators, they provide billions of dollars in services for American agriculture and global agriculture. It's really hard to overstate just how much we rely on different kinds of pollinating insects in order to successfully grow things like apples, almonds, uh, blueberries, things like macadamia nuts, even tomatoes. Uh, While tomatoes are sort of vibrationally pollinated or wind pollinated in many situations, in others you do have uh, other situations, bumblebees come in and they vibrate at just the right frequency to release that pollen from that flower and help to pollinate your tomatoes. So a lot of things that we enjoy eating, basically everything that's delicious in the produce section at your local Kroger, that is probably there because of a bug touching it at some point. So we're very invested in the success of these organisms. And I always like to point out that while there's billions of dollars tied up in this, that's really talking about sort of the the national ag or the global ag system. It's really important on a local level too. Uh, Things that we enjoy as part of our urban landscapes, um, including our annual and perennial flowers, those are all a result of pollination. Those flowers only really exist to bring in insects and other pollinators to visit them. So that beauty that we enjoy, and this even includes trees that are a part of the urban canopy. Um, Trees are visited fairly frequently by pollinating insects. So our woody ornamental shrubs, uh, we try to take care of those plants so that they look nice, but we have to be very conscientious when doing so that we're not harming pollinators and exposing them to things. And then, of course, people have backyard gardens where they're trying to grow something delicious. That's not going to get counted in the national ag census or anything like that. But I just pulled two zucchinis off of a zucchini shrub yesterday, and I wouldn't have gotten those if it weren't for the squash bees that I saw buzzing around in my garden the week before. So we definitely love these things. Um, they're always lifted up as the sort of number one insect group that people are willing to, to put up with. They're the most charismatic, and it's why we have this whole week dedicated to them. The celebration started um, on Saturday, this past Saturday, and it will finish at the end of this week. Um, There's been lots of activities here in the Lexington area, starting at McConnell Springs. Uh, I'm leading a pollinator safari this Friday at the Arboretum. If people are interested in joining us, you can come at 2 p.m. to the, the local Lexington, Kentucky Arboretum. And we are going to be out there collecting some insects so uh, and releasing them. We won't be harming the pollinators. Uh, in terms of what pollinators people uh, are going to notice the most, the most well-known pollinator that's out there is, of course, the honeybee. Honeybees are an incredibly important insect. They are, are used for our agriculture. 
They are interesting in of themselves because they're actually kind of livestock in a way. They're domesticated. You don't have a lot of wild bee populations, honeybee populations in particular out there. Uh, there are some, but by and large, bees are kept as animals on farms by beekeepers. These insects are also not native to the United States. I know that this comes up a lot with things like the Native Plant Society and others who are sort of nativist conservationists. Uh, technically speaking, this insect doesn't really belong here. Uh, we love this insect. We've loved it for a long time. You can see in ancient Egypt uh, that there were people keeping bees even back then. This is a beekeeper. Um, he seems to be raising his hands up to these clay pots. Uh, the clay pots are what they kept the bees in. If the size is true here, I can see why he's a little cautious. Those bees look like they're about the size of house cats. Uh, but they had interesting sort of mythology and religion around honeybees. They believed that they were the result of the, the tears of the sun god Ra, and that when he cried, the bees came out, and then the bees were there to help uh, 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 produce this honey that was a food stuff. So they had beekeeping practices. They were, I think, the first people, the ancient Egyptians, were to figure out how to smoke bees. Uh, if you ever meet a beekeeper and see them working with their hive, you'll notice a smoker that they'll have. Uh, the smoke that comes out helps to soothe the bees a little bit and let them get into the hive. The Egyptians, uh, they did that with incense. They were able to work with their bees through that process. We loved these so much, we brought them with us here to the new world, quote unquote, new world. When colonists and Europeans started arriving, um, they brought them over on those colonizing ships and they were released. Um, you, you can read different things, different accounts in places like Kentucky, actually, of how bees were an early indicator that white settlers were moving into an area and native people would, would sort of notice these insects and then start to prepare to see the settlers arrive. Uh, this insect is greatly appreciated, even though it's not native. It is the state insect of Kentucky. Um, this was done, I think, back in 2010. Before that, we were we were known for having our state insect be the viceroy butterfly. Uh, no other state had that. Uh, but in the in uh, 2010, they decided to add the honeybee and make it sort of the state agriculture insect. Uh, so that's been around for a few years. It's just definitely very, very appreciated. But I think it gets a little too much love, frankly. A lot of people focus just on the honeybee. You'll see a lot of campaigns to save the honeybee. It's important to point out there's about 4,000 species of wild native bees that provide pollination services here in the United States as well. A lot of these will fall into the major categories of things like bumblebees. Um, bumblebees are, uh, they're really wonderful little critters. They're a, a little bit different than the honeybee because they're bigger. They're kind of big and hairy. Uh, I kind of feel like I resemble a honeybee with my beard and my shaggy hair and kind of bumbling around. They are really good at pollinating different kinds of flowers. Um, they're very stout. They're very hardy organisms. They are social, just like a honeybee. They have a queen and workers and drones in the colony. A little bit different than honeybees, they're ground nesters. Most honeybees aren't going to end up in the ground in a hole. But with bumblebees, they often take over abandoned rodent burrows and places like that. And that's where the initial queen will set up her nest. Another difference between bumblebees and honeybees are that bumblebees are annual colonies. So the queen and all of her workers, they'll die around October or November, and only the new queens that she's produced will go into the next year. And if you interrupt her ability to make those new queens, say with an insecticide application, uh, you could cause local perturbations in the bumblebee population. So they visit lots of different wildflowers. They visit lots of different crops. Um, they're just really important pollinators that I think often get overlooked or are viewed as pests in some situations, depending on where they've built their home. Um, I also wanted to point out that we have things like mason bees and leafcutter bees. You may hear these referred to as the megachylids in different literature. Uh, megachylids are named after what they build their nests with. Mason bees are going to use mud and sand in order to construct sort of clay pots that they would insert their eggs into as well as a brick of pollen that they've produced. Um, these leafcutter bees that you see here, uh, leafcutter bees, they kind of use these sharp mandibles and they cut this like zip of leaf tissue off of a plant. And then they fold that up origami style and stuff it into a hollow tube. Um, they'll usually use canes that they find in the woods or in, in surrounding areas, but they'll also get a little wise sometimes and use drainage pipes on your house. Um, I've even seen them in between the different parts of the window. They'll find that kind of gap in between your top window and bottom window and the track, and they'll stuff them in there and use that as a home. 
Uh, these ones are not social. So it's just an individual female kind of out on her own, living in the world and working. And she's collecting all this pollen and collecting all this material and constructing her home, her nest, and then uh, not really raising her young. She builds everything up for them, but then she'll perish. Uh, they are also different than the other bees because they don't carry pollen in the normal spot. Most bees are going to carry pollen on their legs. You'll notice that bee legs tend to be extremely hairy. And on the top of their kind of back thigh, you'll see these big balls of pollen that get congealed there. On the mason and leafcutter bees, the pollen collecting hairs are instead on their stomach. They have a very hairy tummy. Maybe some of you kind of sympathize with that, but that's where all the pollen is going to get stuck with these species. Uh, other than that, they have big heads. Um, they're kind of stout looking. They don't have as tapered of a waist compared to other bees, uh, but they generally are this kind of blackish brown color as well. The more spectacular looking bees that you might encounter are known as sweat bees. You may also hear them called the halictids. Halictids tend to be a metallic uh, color uh, mixed with black and yellow. So most of the ones we see here are green. They're this bright, shiny green color. Uh, the most common halictid that I see is the green in front, and then the abdomen is a mixture of black and yellow. Um, this is They have un, <laughs> uncreative names like the green metallic sweat bee or the green, black, and yellow metallic sweat bee. Uh, you may see some that are blue, some of them that are kind of just a metallic black color. There are some purple species. These do come to people occasionally. Uh, your sweat does taste good to them, so they'll try to lick it up if they can. Sweat bee as a common name can be confusing. Some people will call hoverflies sweat bees uh, just because they look like a bee even though they're a fly and they are much more prone to licking up that sweat. So it gets a little confusing when people hear the name sweat bee. Uh, these build their nests in the ground as well. They just kind of mass provision their young. They put a bunch of pollen in there and then they will lay their eggs and the eggs will hatch and the larva will be able to eat the pollen, but they're not sticking around to care for them. There, are, there isn't a queen and workers with these sort of wild native bees. The last one I wanna mention is actually one that we've gotten a lot of inquiries about this year. These are the mining bees also known as the Andrinids. Andrinids are smaller than the other bees we've been talking about here today. Uh, so we're under a half an inch in length usually, usually kind of a dull black or dull brown color. Um, they have short kind of punky hairs uh, lining the, the different segments of their body, as you can see here. Really good at pollen uh, collection. They are not as big, but they do work a lot to, to get all the food that they need. They're solitary. The reason that we've gotten a lot of calls this year is that they'll find sort of well-drained soil uh, that doesn't flood, but it might be next to a creek bank or a river bank. Uh, it could also be in a park sort of near a pond. And it's nice and moist, but it's not super wet. It gives them a good spot to build in. And you'll see these little tiny holes in the ground. It looks like somebody's gone through and probed it with a coat hanger or maybe a slightly uh, larger gauge of wire. And there's just dozens or hundreds of these holes there. And people are concerned that it's grubs or beetles or something. And it's most often mining bees that are emerging from the soil. They do dig down in there and build their nests. So uh, just a lot of different bees that are out there. Hopefully, as you kind of wander the woods or wander on your property, you can gain an appreciation for some of these that are there. The other pollinators that are out there, though, they're not as charismatic usually. Uh, they're not usually as appreciated as the bees are, and that includes the flies. Uh, flies are the second most important group of pollinating insects. Some of the flies that pollinate are tricked into doing it. You can see a fly on the left here that's visiting what looks like a, a piece of rotten meat that's kind of hairy. This is a flower that mimics the smell and the appearance of a rotten carcass, and it draws flies in. Flies are very hairy. I don't know if you've ever picked one up, if you found a dead one and looked at it. But similar to bees, their bodies are covered in these thick hairs, and it makes them really good at picking up pollen. And they need sugar water, nectar, in order to power their, their frequent flight. So flies love to come to flowers. Uh, on the other side here, we have a hoverfly. That's what I was referring to before. Is a, sometimes people call it a sweat bee. Uh, sometimes people call them corn bees or corn flies. Uh, just depends on where you're at in the state. But they have these big red eyes and then kind of a bee-looking body. They are purposeful pollinators. They actually are attracted to flowers and are performing uh, pollination collection. You can find lots of different examples of this in the state. We've got a, a bumblebee fly here in the yellow flower. This is a tachinid fly on the white little uh, puffy flower here. Tachinid flies lay their eggs on caterpillars and grubs, and then their larvae kill those pests. And then as adults, 
they're beneficial pollinators. So they're good all the way around in their life. Uh, they're just kind of weird looking, so they're not always appreciated. Down here in the bottom, in the multi-pointed white flower, that's a male mosquito. Male mosquitoes don't take blood meals. They use their antenna to find females and flowers. They live kind of a, a vegan, peace-like, hippie lifestyle, dude. And they drink up nectar from those flowers with that long uh, needle-like mouth part that the female would use instead on a human or other animal. So these flies all pollinate and they move that pollen around and they contribute to the overall success of pollination agriculture. The other group that people do like, uh, but aren't necessarily as important as these first two that we've talked about are the moths and butterflies, the lepidopterans. Um, butterflies and moths visit a lot of flowers. Their bodies aren't necessarily as hairy as these other groups, so they don't collect a ton of pollen, but they do get some. Uh, the reason that we like moths and butterflies is that they tend to be able to go greater distances and move pollen further than a honeybee or a bumblebee, which are a little more tied to that nest and staying local. So bees, they want to stay around their home, while butterflies and moths, they're willing to, to kind of ramble and wander around. In some cases, um, uh, we, in particular with moths, they, there are situations where a moth is the only thing that visits a specific flower. Their tongue is specifically designed to visit that flower. They're the only one that can pollinate it and get the nectar. And so uh, it's a very interesting system with these butterflies and moths. I don't want to shortchange them, but I did want to point out, relatively speaking, they're not the most important pollinators. Uh, in terms of planting for pollinators, there's lots of different options out there. We do see different groups that are uh, active, that are providing materials like the Monarch Way Station folks. If you've ever heard of Dr. Dan Potter, uh, just recently retired from our department, he's published a few different things on building a better Monarch Way Station that you can find on our website, uh, entomology at uky.edu. And you can look through some of his materials on that. Um, we've also published on how to build just a general pollinator habitat. But to kind of boil a lot of those lessons down, um, if you were interested in doing this on your own land, the thing to consider first is uh, picking out a, a significant area. You don't want to think about these things as just one or two flowers. I have had phone calls where somebody will say, oh, I planted a milkweed next to my house and I haven't seen a monarch. Or um, I was planting for bees and I haven't seen any bees this year. Are they all dead? And you ask them what they plan, and it's like one tulip or one buttercup. And you really aren't going to attract these organisms with just one or two things. Uh, I don't want to downplay anybody's efforts. Like, it's important that everybody kind of chips in. But these are things that are flying up in the air. They got to be able to see what it is that you're putting out. And they're kind of trying to figure it out in comparison to the rest of the landscape. If they can't see a big patch of something they want to eat on, they're probably not going to be interested in. So take a six by six area or even bigger and turn that from lawn, turn that from sort of rocky outcrop, um, do it along the edge of your crop fields or your garden and just set this area aside to not go wild necessarily, but to turn it into a pollinator habitat. Letting things go wild often ends up with different invasive species. So you do wanna try and be a little more conscientious and a little more purposeful uh, try and clear that area out and then plant something uh, that's a pollinator mix for whatever area it is that you live in. There's lots of Kentucky seed companies that provide Kentucky specific packets that will succeed here, but it, it also can kind of depend on what you're looking to attract. Um, if you want to attract bees, there are certain types of flowers that are most, specific, uh, most attractive to them. Uh, if you... Uh, uh, just making sure you could still see it. It said you could just now see it. Uh, so the that's called a pollination syndrome. It's what makes certain flowers attractive to specific kinds of insects. Each group has a different example. So with bees, uh, they have a pollination syndrome where they tend to prefer open, bowl-shaped flowers. Um, they are like a kind of big flower like that, or they like a complex series of flowers like foxglove that they can go and just keep hitting all these different spots that are full of nectar. So it's kind of a biggest bang for their buck. They also have preferences for color. They like yellow, white, and blue flowers the most. Uh, you'll see them on others, but those are their preferred colors. As bees, they need a lot of nectar. They also like a lot of pollen. Uh, they use both things. And so plants that are listed as having both of those traits in high amounts will also be attractive to bees. If you want to plant for butterflies, which is what a lot of people end up wanting to do, 
they have a few different kinds of requirements. They like large and showy flowers. They want kind of a landing pad, like you can see on the right here. Uh, butterflies don't hover in front of their flower food resource. They land and then dip their proboscis down into it. So they like kind of a flat top flower or flowers with areas where they can rest their feet, like we see on the cherry tree on the left side here. They do like pink and lavender quite a bit, a little different than other types of pollinators. Uh, they like a high scent, so a flower that's quite odiferous, that smells good to them. Um, and then they like plants with lots of nectar and low pollen. They don't eat pollen, so they're not as interested in it. Moths have their own specific uh, syndrome as well. Uh, a moth is typically active at night, so they like night opening flowers. Think of something like a moon flower. Uh, they like it to be heavily scented, so it's easier to find in the evening or in the dark. They also tend to prefer white flowers, which are more visible at night. And they like them with a long corolla because moths often have really long proboscises that they need to unfurl and then dip down into the flower. And of course, lots and lots of nectar uh, to fuel that buzzing flight that they have. With flies, you could have a flower that looks like rotting meat and also smells like rotting meat. Most people aren't really interested in putting a dead horse arum out in their garden. So we don't see a lot of that getting done. Basically, if you plant for bees, you're also going to attract the true pollinating flies like hoverflies that we see on the left or on the right here. Uh, they like yellow, blue, and white the most as well. Finally, um, there are different things that you could sort of sign up for. If you do Monarch Way Station, this is a national project where they'll sell you the seed and then a sign that you can put up. Uh, you can make your own plots and then contribute to this overall effort. Um, if you want to do things like uh, plant for butterflies, it's also important to include their caterpillar food resources. So, for example, if you wanted to attract gray hair streaks, you would want to plant mints, uh, black swallowtails like we see on the right here. They like dill, fennel, or parsley. So you can plant for the adults to feed, but you should also have a place for them to lay their eggs so that these caterpillars can oh, take advantage of the, the different resources that you're putting out. It'll increase the amount of adults that you see, which are the ones that most people are interested in viewing. So you can see these beautiful butterflies. Uh, you can do this at home. You can do it at your church, your business, a public property if you work with that group. Um, there's Operation Pollinator, quite a few things that are out there at this point where you could build a pollinator area and try to uh, uh, increase their populations. It's important to point out that some people get a little hairy about this. The bees that we're talking about, once they're in these areas, they're unlikely to sting. If they're feeding, they're not interested in defending themselves normally. But if you put up signs, that's enough of a warning to say you're entering a bee area, a bee protection area, be aware, uh, take caution if you're allergic, something like that, I think would help to make sure that you keep tempers sort of down and everybody safe. Uh, the final thing I'll mention is that we talked a little bit about the nesting sites for some of these bees. If you put out pebble mulch, if you make sandy kind of areas that are well-drained, uh, the mining bees will come in, the different kinds of helictids and others. They'll use these places to construct a nest down in the ground so that they can also tend to their, their larva. Uh, these are all kind of going to be needed. They're combined. You can't do it one piece at a time. You kind of have to figure out how to implement this over a couple of years so that all the pieces are in place and you can help these pollinators to recover from past perturbations. You can also just do this by putting out bee hotels. Uh, bee hotels are a little tricky because people often put them up and forget about them. You do need to change things like the bamboo out every year um, after the bees have emerged. You'll also want to sanitize the bottom portions or these like drilled portions because diseases can build up in there. So a soap, soapy wash, chlorine wash, anything to kind of get different viruses and things out of there so that it's safe for more bees to use, that would be a very good step. I hope that you'll uh, consider joining us for Pollinator Week this year as well as next year. Um, I think it's a lot of fun. It's important because, like I said, our success in ag is kind of tied up in their success. So uh, Renee, Dilly, are, are you pollinator fans or what's your favorite pollinating insect? Thank you. I love them all. <laughs> really, I really do. I think they're so cool and it's such an amazing um, 
the coexistence we have with these things and the dependence on them. Yeah. Okay. And I never realized flies were pollinators because I never thought flies were good for anything, but to bug you. <laughs> right. And so now I'm like, okay, well, at least they have a higher purpose. It's true. <laughs> so that's good. Yep. yep. All those hairs are there for a reason. Uh, yeah. It's true that they get in spots that we'd rather they didn't, but for the most part, flies are, are pretty beneficial. They're hard to identify, but they're pretty beneficial. Good to know. I appreciate you letting us know that because I always, you know, try to get rid of them. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, right. I will duck out of this happy moment. We'll give you another moment tips. in a minute. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Larson, thank you so much. Really appreciate and enjoyed that. Uh, that was good stuff. And uh, he's always uh, he's so knowledgeable and got such good content. It's really good to have him on the show regularly. It really is. You know, speaking I, of good content, yes. uh, we have a tree of the week. I know this tree. Oh, I love it. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful tree. Um, not everybody's probably familiar with this tree, but again, <laughs> if you're it kind of in a cove area that's nice and cool, um, got some good moisture there you might find this tree it's a beautiful tree i'll go ahead and share it now though go ahead i'm laurie thomas with the university of kentucky forestry natural resources extension and i'm here with the tree of the week the big leaf magnolia big leaf magnolia magnolia macrophylla is a deciduous to semi evergreen tree that is known for its extremely large leaves in fact it has some of the largest simple leaves of any tree native to north america Big Leaf Magnolia typically grows about 30 to 40 feet tall, and it has a rounded canopy and somewhat coarse appearance. It has a moderate growth rate and is relatively short-lived. Big Leaf Magnolia is typically an understory tree in a forest setting. The unusually large leaves and showy flowers make this a really interesting specimen tree in the landscape. Big Leaf Magnolia is native to Ohio, down to Florida, in Arkansas, and to Louisiana. While it occurs over a relatively large area, it is a scarce tree throughout its range. In Kentucky, it is found mostly in the eastern part of the state. Trees grow best in moist, well-drained soils that are slightly acidic and with a fair amount of organic content. It is usually found growing in river valleys, coves, or ravines, and along streams. The tree is classified as shade tolerant. Trees are susceptible to ice and wind damage, and if planting is a specimen tree in the landscape, the site should meet the tree's soil and moisture requirements and provide protection from wind. It should be noted that the large leaves decompose slowly, and some may consider them unsightly. The leaves are deciduous, but can be semi-evergreen in the deep south. They are alternately arranged on the twig and simple in form. They're usually about 20 to 30 inches long with entire, somewhat wavy margins. The base of the leaf resembles two earlobes, or the letter B, as you can see in the picture. And this is a good way to tell big leaf magnolia from umbrella magnolia, which has a V-shaped leaf base, which you can also see in the photo. The leaves are green above and whitish with hairs on the underside, and fall leaf color is yellow. Big Leaf Magnolia is monoecious, meaning the tree has both male and female flowers. The flowers are creamy white, large, about 10 to 14 inches across. They're showy and very fragrant. The inner flower petals tend to have a light purple stain near the base. The flowers bloom in spring from May until June, depending on location. And trees typically begin to flower after about 12 years of age. And the flowers are pollinated by beetles. The fruit is cone-like and nearly round, and it's typically about two to three inches long. And as it matures, it turns to a nice, a very attractive rose color. The surface is somewhat fuzzy, and the fruit ripens in late summer and releases individual red-coated seeds suspended on slender threads at maturity. A few songbirds and a few small mammals eat the seeds. The bark is thin, smooth, and grayish-brown, and tends to develop platy patches as the tree ages. The national champion Big Leaf Magnolia as of 2021 is in Baltimore, Maryland. It has a 90 inch circumference. It's 70 feet tall with a 56 foot crown spread. The Kentucky champion as of 2021 is in Bell County at Pine Mountain State Resort Park. It has a 35 inch circumference, is 60 feet tall with an 18 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest National Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about Big Leaf Magnolia. The tree's common name comes from its very large leaves. In fact, they are considered the largest simple leaves in North America. 
Native Americans, including the Cherokee, used the inner bark as an analgesic, for, also for an upset stomach and for toothaches. Big leaf magnolia was described by the French naturalist André Michaud in 1795 and was introduced into cultivation in 1800. Even though it's not widely used as a landscape tree, it's more of a specimen tree. In fall and winter, after the leaves have fallen to the forest floor, it appears to be strewn with newspaper underneath those trees. The genus name Magnolia was in honor of 18th century French botanist Pierre Magnol, and the species name Macrophylla is from the Greek macros and phyla, which means large leaves. I hope you enjoyed learning about big leaf magnolia. You get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy this most interesting magnolia. Well, you know, we greatly appreciate that, Lori, and we, we love how she does does these videos for us. And, you know, I bet there's some pollinators that might like that. I don't know. I'll have to ask Dr. Larson. <laughs> yeah, about I'm that. sure he can and, tell us for sure. Yeah, it's a big white flower that's very fragrant. So maybe there might be a few. <laughs> so. Really cool tree. Yeah, hopefully you get a chance to see that. And, and you see it in the wild. It's just really, really impressive. You know, those leaves yeah. are amazing. It's really right. cool. Oh, thank you, Lori. <laughs> So now we'll bring Dr. Larson back on to talk I know, about something what, what, that I don't know if I want to hear. I know. So, <laughs> so we had you with the bright and shiny and happy people. Lovely, up there. Happy. <laughs> um, now you're giving us vampires. <laughs> a, little bit of, a little bit of blood sucking ninjas. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as, important stuff, though, so. as for pollination and magnolias, it's a kind of an interesting history. They were uh, adapted to be pollinated by beetles uh, hundreds of oh. millions of years ago. So uh, beetles do pollinate some things. I didn't mention them because they're not in the top three necessarily, uh -huh. uh, but some, some beetles do pollinate. Uh, I don't believe that the, the like preferred beetle is maybe around anymore. Uh, we do see flies on magnolias as well. So it's quite fragrant. You're right. Quite white. Um, it brings in those, all the bugs to the yard. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm, maybe I might reconsider planting a magnolia. I don't know. <laughs> there are a lot of magnolias here in town. So, there are, you know, there are, yeah. <laughs> spread the love. Get a witch hazel or something, right? There you go. There you go. There you go. All right. Now we're going to start talking about ticks. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me try to get back to the start of this. So the reason that I was invited on to talk about ticks today stems from a tick research project that's been initiated here at the University of Kentucky. Um, I'm guessing some of you have heard about it before or seen it on Facebook. Uh, because of all these tick issues that we hear about here in Kentucky, mainly the increased incidence of Lyme, uh, incre increased incidence of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, as well as the sort of ascension of alpha-gal red meat allergy in the state, all of that is combined to make people very nervous. Uh, we try to provide a service as the land-grant university. And so a research group here on campus, they have been focused on ticks for the last few years. Uh, they had this idea that maybe we could expand their efforts and reach more people and get more ticks from them. Uh, initially, when they conceived of the project back in about 2019, 2018, they had a designed a project where people that are work in veterinary offices and doctor's offices, if they found a tick on a person or a tick was brought in uh, by a pet owner or a human, that tick could be submitted through a process to us, and then it would be identified and potentially tested for pathogens. Uh, but there was a hope, okay, maybe we can expand beyond these professionals and do some true citizen science and recruit people in just from the general public to submit ticks because so many people are ending up with ticks on their bodies. So this was in 2022. Uh, they decided this like in January-ish, February-ish, and they kind of came up with a protocol. And then there was a press release about this. And this is, a, it's a longer story, but I hope I, 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 can, I have enough rope to, <laughs> to unspool it for you here today. But essentially, this press release came out and it talked about all this different research that's going on in our department, ranging from ticks to bed bugs to mosquitoes, how we're battling these bad bugs, winning the bug battle, I think was what it was called. And in that press release was this bit about, okay, we're going to do this tick citizen science project. The media really honed in on that. And our local newspaper, the Herald Leader, you can see the article that they kind of spun from this press release. It was titled, Found a Tick mail it to this UK professor to see if it carries disease. I just want to throw out there, I was not involved in this project. I didn't come up with it. Um, I was not a, a contributing member of it, but I got kind of wrangled into it because when they made this article, 
they also decided to include a video of me that they had taken the year before. Uh, so this was in 2021, uh, height of COVID stuff. They interviewed me right after I had finished being in the greenhouse all day. I still had my COVID hair, hadn't had a haircut in over a year. And so I looked like a, a wild lion with a black mask on and they were talking to me about ticks. But now it says found a tick, this UK professor wants it. And then the UK professor that is named is one Jonathan Larson. Uh, and so it seemed as if I wanted people to mail me ticks. Uh, further, this gets a bit corrupted by other uh, telephone games where it's taken into local newspapers. And if you've ever read an, an article in a local newspaper, smaller newspaper that involves an extension type activity, it's of course at the end going to say, go to your local extension office and they're gonna know all about this. So they, the extension agents in various communities start tracing this back. And it seems like I'm the one that's initiated this. I started getting a lot of rather angry emails about why do you want these ticks? Didn't you cut your hair? What's going on? Nobody prepared us for this. This just is, it's, it's crazy. There's all these people that have ticks. Uh, what are we supposed to do with them? And so we tried to look into why this was occurring. It was partially the media. It also was partially because of Facebook. Uh, Facebook uh, is a huge social media network, of course. Private individuals started posting about this on their own Facebooks, and then other people were posting it to their business Facebook page. And of course, these get shared. Uh, this version that you see on the right, this is from a woman who calls herself Dr. Monica on Facebook. She is a meme-loving pharmacist, and she somehow found out about this. She has a national, semi-global audience, and she just sort of put this thing together that said, anybody that gets a tick, no matter where you are, the University of Kentucky wants it. And she found this really nice graphic of ticks. She put our address on there. Um, she gave a lot of information that was really incorrect. Uh, you can see that it was shared 31,000 times when I took this screen grab um, with a couple of others. There was about 56,000 shares. Uh, when that number hits that range, you're talking about it's seen by about a million people. Uh, this one that you see on the left, this is the version that's been going around this year. Um, it's a little stripped down, but it, and it also says it's just for Kentucky residents. I don't know who came up with the attention and asterisk stars thing. It looks like a sort of a chain letter, uh, but people from all over the country, all over the world saw this. We were not pleased in the end because this is all incorrect information. Um, ticks need to be from Kentucky. Uh, the worst part was a graduate student that was involved with this. Her personal information got leaked through this whole thing. Um, we got wrapped up in conspiracy theories. People were claiming that UK, we wanted all these ticks so that we could collect your DNA and clone you um, and give the uh, billionaire elite of the world organs uh, that, that had been cloned from your DNA that we salvaged from ticks. I don't know what they think the budget is here at the University of Kentucky, but we, we ain't got any secret cloning facilities, I can tell you that much. Uh, the, so that's all very weird. Uh, the sort of practical side of this was we were getting over 300 ticks a day uh, for about a month or so from all over the country. People were sending them in live. Uh, people would just brush ticks off of their animals. So we'd get boxes that were full of cat hair and ticks and you'd open it up and they'd start scrambling, try to get out. We had fully engorged ticks that were tossed in paper envelopes and then sent through the USPS. Um, they were popped by the various machines. So we'd get these blood soaked envelopes. People were just soaking things in alcohol or pouring alcohol into various containers and trying to mail that around. That's a felony offense um, with a $50,000 fine because it's flammable. And so this got way out of control. Uh, we've tried to correct all the misinformation. Um, the other thing is that people kind of got the idea that this was a free medical service, that all these ticks that were sent in were being tested and people would be told if it was possible they were going to get sick. Unfortunately, um, that is not what happens with this. This is a voluntary citizen science effort. If you want to participate, there are strict protocols that have to be adhered to. You can find it on our website, entomology.caukyy.edu, tick surveillance 2022. Um, there's a way to kill the tick by submerging it in alcohol for 20 hours, 24 hours, pouring the excess alcohol out, and then putting a cotton ball in a plastic bag and putting the tick in there, and then sealing that and packaging it correctly. You also have to include this form that you can find on the same website. If it doesn't include this form, the tick is discarded. Um, if it's from out of state, the tick is discarded. If it's not packaged correctly, the tick is discarded. 
And so there's a lot of things that weren't getting processed, but these people are, there's so many of them and only one person working on this project in that research group, they can't contact everybody. So what we're trying to stress to folks is if you haven't heard anything from them and you followed all the rules, it means there was a no, it was a negative result. You didn't have a tick that tested positive. Only people who have a tick that tests positive for one of the three pathogens they're testing for, ehrlichiosis, Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. If it has one of those, you will be contacted. Otherwise, no news is good news. Uh, this is not quick. It takes them many weeks to do all of this because of this backlog. It's not a medical service. If you are afraid your tick contained a pathogen and that you are ill, you need to use a professional tick testing service uh, that is paid and you need to go to the doctor. You need to consult with a physician and see if you can get some antibiotics or see if they have a tick testing service that they're able to use. This is not to be relied upon for medical advice or for medical decisions. Uh, so if you haven't heard anything, you followed all the rules, that's good news. If you're afraid you didn't follow the rules, you can contact our department. Our website has our phone number and they may be able to look you up. They keep a database of all the submissions that we've received and somebody will hopefully be able to cross-reference your name and tell you if your tick was accepted or not, but you would have to contact us for that. In terms of protecting yourselves from ticks, Renee asked if I could do that uh, as well. This is the high tick season that we're in. May and June is the worst time of the year. Consider long pants and long sleeves, wearing lighter colored clothing so you can see ticks more easily. I encourage you to tuck your pants down into your socks. It doesn't look very fashionable, but it takes away one of the easy access points that ticks have to our body. You should perform a tick check on yourself and your pets whenever you come inside. Um, this is even after just five or 10 minutes being outside in your backyard, do a tick check. You don't wanna give them access to you. So look in your hair, in and around your ears, in your belly button, under your arms, around your waist, your groin, and behind your knees. Do wear some repellents. DEET is the best. It's the standby. The higher the percentage in the product, the longer it lasts. If you're not a fan of DEET, uh, it does plasticize things, and some people don't enjoy the odor. You have other options, including picaridin, IR3535, and oil of lemon eucalyptus. They're not as uh, potent against ticks and mosquitoes, but they do work um, in some of the similar time ranges. So those are some other options. If you're somebody that's in the woods a lot, if you're outdoors a lot, permethrin treated clothing is going to really be your best friend. Either treat your clothes yourself or uh, apply, uh, or buy permethrin impregnated clothing, and then you get a longer uh, lasting permethrin in, that, in the clothing. Um, it'll last for more washes is what I'm trying to say. Uh, the ticks will die as they touch these, and then you'll shake your clothes out and you'll find 10 or 12 dead ticks and uh, it'll feel very satisfying for you. Those are kind of the best things that you can do if you wanna prevent ticks. If you do have one that's bitten you, remove it using a pair of tweezers. I highly encourage you not to use fire or alcohol or essential oils um, or fingernail polish or anything like that on the tick. If you agitate it while it's plugged into you, it could vomit into you, increasing the likelihood of disease transmission. So just pull it out, squeeze it by its head closest to your skin and pull straight up. That will be difficult, but not impossible. Uh, once you get it out, I encourage you to put it in a pill bottle or a yogurt cup with alcohol and monitor yourself for rashes, fevers, fatigue. And that way, if you do start to feel sick, you can take the tick with you to the doctor for testing or just for identification. I think I covered everything about ticks that we were hoping for here. Did I leave anything out you wanted to know, Billy or Renee? Or did I take us over time? No, you're good. That's a, I, I appreciate you um, sharing that information. Certainly as yeah. we're out in the woods and um, checking things out, we want to be vigilant and, and be protective of ourselves. And, uh, you know, and, uh, the story, it, it's almost like you could write, uh, this is, I could envision a podcast or something about what happened <laughs> with this tick project. It's like think, a saga. Dr. I think Parson. it's, yeah. It, it feels crazy. like an episode of Parks and Recreation, it honestly. Uh, I, I was sitting here laughing. I'm like, oh gosh. Just I was too. I was sitting there laughing the girl. whole time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it's an important thing. If, if you submit the ticks, it does help. It furthers our efforts to understand what ticks live in what counties in this state and what pathogens could possibly be in these other counties. Uh, we had a grad student that did a really great tick survey. She got 119 of the 120 counties. Uh, she only missed the western tip one. Uh, is that Fulton with the with the island? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Look at the map. I don't remember. Yeah, I, I'm, okay. I'm from Indiana. Uh, that's, I think that's <laughs> the only one she didn't get to. But uh, we have a lot of good data from that. But this is a, is a way to amplify that even further. So if you want to help, we appreciate it. But there are some rules that you have to follow. So go to our website. It's the banner thing at the top. And you can contribute that way. Uh, and we we do appreciate everybody that's attempted to, even the people that drew little cartoons of their cat in a science outfit saying they're ready to to do tick science, uh, and the people that tried to send us live ticks. I, you have a special place in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what an overwhelming response, right? You know that's you, right. I love it. You, reeling, me, reeling me back from the edge, yeah, trying come to on. It, get rid I of mean, the cynicism. Yes, people care about what you all are doing, right? That's they right. Really that's right. So that's and we want to keep people safe. Yes. Uh, yeah. The Department of Public Health, they also have some live interactive maps that tell you what counties have the most incidence of the of Lyme, Rocky Mountain, and Ehrlichiosis. You can check that out as well and click on each county and see what your home county is reporting in regards to those diseases. Okay. Well, yeah, thanks for having me. No, always. us how to avoid them for sure. <laughs> yeah. Be careful out there. Stay safe. Yeah, we will. Thank you, Dr. Thank Hart. you. Really, appreciate really appreciate you being on. Yeah. No, oh, he's so great. Like yeah. I said, two ends of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, he did a great job in both of them. No, uh, we're we're lucky to have him as our resident entomologist for sure. So <laughs> definitely. Big thanks to Laurie as well for the big yes. leaf magnolia. What a cool tree! So hopefully you get a chance to see that. But we appreciate y'all being with us today. And as always, you know, if you've got questions or if there's things you'd like to see on the show, um, hit us at fromthewoodstoday.com. We have a little survey on there, and you can complete that and let us know if there's a topic you'd like to see, or if you've seen something interesting out in your woods let us know and we might feature it on a future episode definitely um and you know all of our past episodes um are on from the woods today.com so you could easily go there and find out anything if you're like oh you get, get out from in the woods you find a tick and you can't remember how to remove it <laughs> so you, you go there real quick and and get that information so mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we greatly appreciate you joining us, though, because we wouldn't have a show if it wasn't for you all. Um, so we greatly appreciate you joining us each and every week at 11 o'clock. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. And we'll look forward to seeing you all next week on From the Woods Today. Take care. Bye. Bye. From the Woods Today.